we're gonna have much time on this zoom okay which is better because i will keep it coin size because otherwise oh. i can keep talking for like over right. an hour <laughs> Um, so there was nothing to prepare, uh, because it's basically conversational. Um, and my first question is, who is Vicky today versus who would you have been in the past? Who would I have been in the past? Mm -hmm. I always envision, envision myself, I suppose, as being a seer to um, Queen Victoria. Mm. So maybe I was Mr. Brown. <laughs> Mr. Brown. Yeah, because he was a dowser and he was her, her seer. See, not many people know that. And who is... Vicky today today I've I, I don't know I'm I'm different people feng shui consultant dowser seer to others kashik record consultant delving into the past and the future for people being a self healer for myself and others being a visionary on many levels I suppose Say, say again. Being a visionary. Mm. Because visionaries aren't the ones that speak out. Visionaries are the ones that see, but don't say. Really? Well, if you think about the teachings of Nostradamus and many other visionaries, you didn't hear about them until they'd passed away. Because all their, their prophecies had to come true. Or there was people at that time that wrote about their prophecies, especially like Edgar Case and people like that. Um, and it was only afterwards that they saw that their visions were there. And then they got known as visionaries. Do you write down your visions for the future? For I'm going to now. From now on, I am. Yeah. Well, I'm very curious. In fact, it's funny you say it because I was going to ask you. Um, and it's maybe being brought but, Go on. Go on. No, but maybe we cannot say anything. But anyway, if you have anything to say, um, you say you see past seer for people, future and past. Do you apply that, well, I suppose, to humanity? It's humanity and, and everything that's going on in the world around us. That's why when I am out in nature, it's nature that gives me the visions, you know, of what, what's going on in the past, present and future. It's your surroundings. It's what the planet tells you. That's why I love feng shui so much, because there's so much in it. There's a story in everything that you do in your home, what you surround yourself with, in your garden, everything clothes you wear how did you so feng shui it's, it's an ancient chinese do, would you call it practice or philosophy people say it's chinese but it goes back further you know there's tibetan wisdom coming in here you've got the tibetan masters you've got the uh, metaphysics that come from all of the malaysian countries so, you know, people say it's China because a lot of their books were burnt. So the knowledge was lost. But then there's other countries that had this knowledge. Otherwise, it wouldn't have survived like it has done. And, you know, and it goes back to the art of war with Sai Su, you know, and, and businessmen knew that. So there's all of this going on in the background that people use all this um, feng shui and, and everything else and the astrology you know, it's not many people know actually about the four pillar astrology and time and place and the flying stars, which is far more intricate than Western astrology is. And how did you, 
how did you start or discover it? How did you know it was your thing? I just start, I, I've always been, ever since little girl, I always want to know everything, how it all works. Take clocks apart, take the screw, screwdriver, you know, put it back together again. Okay, I know how that works now. I used to be the fixer when I worked in an office. Fix the computer, fix people's laptops, fix this, fix that. How do you do work this program? Oh, press that button, okay. So I was always fixing things because I wanted to know how things worked. And it's the same way now. I research, I look into it, I delve into it. I go into it deeper. I look at different teachers, look at different masters of feng shui, space clearing. And through that, you learn different parts of that knowledge. And then it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You put it all together and then you know there's more and you never stop learning. You want to keep on learning and you want to know more. Okay, you want to know more about time and place. What happened 60 years ago? Because there's a 60 year cycle. So then you, you look back in time at what's happening now. What happened back in the past? How does it coincide with what's happening now? How can we marry it up? So it's all these different things. And then it measures up with what I do with the Akashic records as well, because you look back at the history and time. And I think, okay, what if I travel back there in the Akashic records? What can that tell me also? And then I go to the buildings around London and around historic places in, in the UK and wherever I go. And that tells you another story. You look at the Masonic symbols and everything else that's going on. And okay, not all the truth is there that you see that's written down. So where is the truth? Well, it's out there in the universe. So you have to delve into universal library of life. Um, I know, and I want to touch this subject because I find it really important even, um, because I studied with you and I s sort of started to get to know you or we talk more and stuff. And I... You, you told me that you're a seer, so not just um, through, through your mind, but you can see with your eyes. Yes, and, and I've worked as, as a seer for various people in my lifetime. So, and it's not just for a few readings, it's for many years that I've worked for people like on this level. So if it doesn't work what you do, they wouldn't employ you for that length of time to see what, it, what yeah, I mean. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your relationship with the elementals. And so the elemental world, how it is now. And when you were little, how did it, how did you approach it? Or how did they approach you? Well, it it's just always been there because my mother was as playful as me, if you know what I mean. She would say, let's go to Fairy Glen. And, and we'd be there. She'd have me walking through rivers and streams looking for the biggest pearl. So I'd go and do this for her while she stood on the watery bank. And I, I'd go wading in and bring up all these muscles and look for the biggest pearl for her. My dog was my best friend. So we'd play in haystacks and and in hedgerows so we we're always in tune with nature with the birds what was going on um and when the fairies came it wasn't like it was something different it was like they were always there so it, it's it's not something that's gone away in fact it's got stronger as i've got older because they want they want to be seen by everyone they want their message to be heard they want their faces to be seen in the trees because they want nature to have a voice. They want nature to know when it's been hurt. Because at the moment, you know, nature is being hurt, it's being damaged. And that's why you can see some of the faces on the trees are sad. It's because they're telling you, even the stone people are coming out with their faces. 
So, you, you know, you've got all these different elements of nature coming to talk to you, to speak to you. If you listen, you don't just see, go, oh, look, there's a face on the tree. Okay, what have you got to say? What would you like to tell me? What do I need to know? I don't put those on my Facebook pages because that's personal to me. But, you know, I'm just giving the hints out there to people that when they see these faces, to have a little chat, you know, telepathically. Don't have to say out loud. And give the tree a hug. Touch the stone. But don't necessarily put it in, put it in your pocket and take it home because it looks pretty, you know? <laughs> I'll remember that because I'm I'm someone who collects. Definitely. Yeah, the fairies are all around. You just have to be aware that sometimes you have pixies and gnomes and elves and water undines and um, little naughty mischievous things that will do things to spark your attention. So you need to be aware. Is there something okay? What what do I need doing? What haven't I done? What do I need to do? And if they're still mischievous and cause water problems and things, I get lots of water problems, maybe because I'm connected with water as a water dowser. But um, sometimes they just want moving to a new home and they need help. You know, maybe the stream or the pond has dried up where they lived, no water source. So you have to help them move to another place. And I've done that many a time. You know, some, somebody said, said to me, well, what, what do I do? And I said, well, I can, I've, I've got his name as Peter, this little water undine. He'd hitched a lift on, on her horse. He'd arrived in her home, caused havoc in, in the um, kitchen with water everywhere. And I said, well, you've got this water undine, Peter, and he needs a, a lift to the lake. So she, I said, get him, you know, I can see him there. You've got to put him in, in your car. She opened the back door for him, said, Peter, are you in the car? She hoped he was. And then she said, when she drove down the road, he's there, Peter, and the radio just turned on. So she switched it off. And she said, was that you, Peter? And the radio turned on again. And then when she arrived at, at, the, at the pond where she was taking him to, these ducks marched up to the door. And when she opened the door, they sort of collected him and took him down to the, down to the lake. She saw these dark ducks march away. It's like he had an escort. So that was confirmation for her. So you don't have to see these little people. It's about knowing that there's other beings, like a duck or the radio coming on, that is saying, yes, I am here. You don't really believe in me, so I have to show you. <laughs> Do you think people are opening up more to them nowadays, or it's still... Well, 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 what it is, some people are still scared. So that's why you don't, they don't see them with their eyes, as it were. They might feel them, sense them, smell them, know that there's something going on around them, but they don't always want to see them because it's like the ghost in the house that you're always told is the bad thing. The poltergeist that's going to do bad things and knock things off the wall and go boo to you and take the sheets off your bed. And, and, that, and that's the sort of thing that they're expecting. And if they're expecting that, that's what they'll get. Because the universe provides you with what you want, right? And that's what you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> oh. if, you, if, you, if you're pleasantly surprised and you're willing to work with the with the Fae and, and the Elemental Kingdom. But remember never to sign up a contract or, do, or anything. Just say, if you can do this for me, I can leave you a gift. Why not never sign contracts? Because I heard something I've been <laughs> told, for example, never make promises. Exactly, because that's a contract. Okay. Because it, you would never sign, sign your life away to the devil or to God for that matter. So it's, it's, it's a, you know, it, it's not a similar thing, but you've got to think of it in that context. Mm -hmm. You know, when you sign up for a job at work, you're very careful. You read the small print 
Well, you can't read the fairy small print. It could be invisible. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to be very careful of what you're letting yourself in for. So you don't do anything like that. You, you work with them, you ask them to do things for you, and then you offer them a gift. You say, what gift would you like? And usually it's food, fruit, a few pennies. It's whatever you, ha it's whatever you have, generally. Sometimes I, I wonder if children were taught this sort of interaction. If maybe growing up, they wouldn't be scared adults or, I don't know, maybe more careful. Well, what it is, it's the school system we have. The school system grinds it out of you. You see... When I was growing up, I read a lot of Enid Blyton books. So you'd have, you know, Enid Blyton's Mysteries, um, School at St. Clair's, Five at St. Clair's, Seven at Mallory Towers. And they all had fun in, in, in the rooms at night and they got up to mischief and things like that. But you'd also have the Noddy and Big Ears books, you know, the little pixie down the lane and things like that. And... Um, you also grew up like with Br'er Rabbit and things. So all those things where the animals came alive and actually had names and the hedgehog and everything else. So when you grow up like that, you used to go out into the fields and the lanes and think, oh, that's Daisy Hedgehog or that's Br'er Rabbit. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then you'd go and talk to those things. What are some things that you don't believe in? What, what do you mean by you don't believe in? So, for example, you believe in fairies and all the, and the world of the elementals. Mm -hmm. Many people think it's just nothing it's um yeah they probably think true. i'm the crazy woman that, that talks to the trees and the fairies and sees faces <laughs> yeah. but what are some things that you don't believe in that um the common the majority of people believes in for example so you mean the everyday things that's on the news is that what you mean ah! <laughs> could be i don't know yeah so it depends what perspective you come from in life you see how do you see the information that you receive every day on a daily basis you see my mother taught me as i grew up that the universe would provide no matter what happens in your life the universe will provide you with whatever you need on a daily basis so it's about being careful of what you thought about, what you wished for, and what came into your life. So you are always prepared to do good things, always prepared to help another person. And she was a very helpful person. She invited people in for, for into her home and fed them lunch, dinner, overnight stays. She, she would ask anybody home that was homeless, anybody that needed a meal, like the gardener across the road, I remember that. Um, Mrs. Dolcey from Dolcey um, Shoes wouldn't um, give her gardener a cup of tea even. So my mother would, would um, invite him to our house. So there's lots of different things like that, you know, and, and growing up, she'd go to healers and things. So it was all about having that consciousness about well-being. Where is your well-being? What do you want at the end of the day? What do you want to create? And she was all into manifesting in a good purposeful way you know not not the um, million pound notes or anything but just so that you have things for yourself and your family and to help others see what we've created in in this world is is it can be a world of greed so if people let go of that feeling of wanting feeling of needing necessity then 
they just know that everything is okay and all right out there in the universe and that whatever is will be and that nature will sort everything out at the end of the day we don't need to push or shout or navigate anything because it will just all come right at the end of the day it always did always has done if you look back through the eons of time and history it always writes itself the bubonic plague finished itself with that great fire of london you know and then there was a new new london that arose out of it and then that all these things all over the world happened all through time atlanteans disappeared why was that we all know why it was they blew themselves up with the technology they amassed great technology and then we don't know anything about that now because it's all gone and what are we doing now we're creating great technology so need i say any more <laughs> It makes me think of, um, um, can't remember now the writer, but he quoted um, a piece of the quote. Uh, he said that basically, if we educate the mind without educating the heart, that there's going to be misalignment and a lot will be missed. Can't Correct. Said it. Because as you know, when I teach the Akashic Records, it's all about coming from your heart energy from here and letting go of this ego up here. And it's only when people come in and they do the first weekend and they go, hmm, and they find it really hard to let go of the head, let go of their thoughts. And suddenly when they've had that release after those first two days and they're feeling it in their heart energy and they know that everything is okay and that they don't really have any problems anymore the problems have dissolved into nothingness because they don't matter what they came there with and wanted to solve like like new job or new house or moving here or moving there or they're not getting on with their friend or their or their partner or somebody might have died and left them but that doesn't matter anymore because what they find is once they come into their heart that everything just comes right in their life that whatever story is unfolding in front of them is what should be. And that could be a new life's journey into living abroad. It could be anything, writing a book, moving house, starting a new life with new friends. But whatever it is, that new journey won't start until you come out of this. And when you come in here, this is when it all starts. See, I grew up as a very naive little girl. I'm still a very naive adult, very naive. And I don't always believe everything that everybody tells me because I know there's something else. And it's always about looking at the mirror, what's reflecting what they're saying. And maybe it could be too that, um, you know, subconsciously that there are two dimensions here. And maybe I'm seeing the other dimension of that person the parallel dimension that we all live in. And maybe when I'm seeing that and I'm seeing, okay, that I've seen this person before or I feel as though I have, what are they really like? What are they really telling me? What's going on there? And then all of a sudden I get that information. So then that knowingness from here and not here just comes in and you know what's the correct pathway and where you need to go and what you need to do. Have you always known who you want to become growing up? Or what would you want to do? When I was growing up, I wanted to be a ballerina. Ballerina or, um, or a model. Mm. So um, my mother bought me red leather ballet shoes only because my cousin had some pink ones and she went to ballet classes. She would not allow me to go to ballet classes. And I could only think that it was because she'd been told by a fortune teller that I would hurt myself in some way, which I did later on in life. When I was 18, I, I got run over by a bus. And 
no matter what it is, what's going to be happening in your life, it will happen one way or another. It just depends when it will happen and what the effect will be on you. As it was, I was very lucky. It's like the angels have lifted the bus off my legs and, and I just had a fractured pelvis and, and a slightly broken elbow, but that was it. I, it was just a miracle, an absolute miracle. Because you could see the bus tire marks on my legs, my shoes are broken. Um, and also, I think my mother had been told I wouldn't walk again, but I got up out of the bed and I, and I just walked to see my friend in, in the other ward who was nursing there. And she said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I've come to see you. And then after that, I just walked and walked and walked. Because if you have it in your mind and you're not told by anybody you can't do this, you can do it because you don't know you can't do it. So if we're told at a young age that you can't do something, then you won't do it. And that was the same with my ballet dancing. I was told I can't do it. So I got an opportunity when I was, well, about two years ago, they did some ballet classes at my gym. And there I was doing my ballet at the bar at last. So it's never say no. The opportunity will come at some point, but it was years and years later. But it is about being careful of what you say to your children about, no, you can't do this. Say, yes, you can do it. Yes, you're clever. Yes, you're bright. Yes, you're beautiful. Because the way you give a child more things to do and tell them how bright and beautiful they are, is like Rudolf Steiner and his teachings, really. They told them how to progress, how to do it in their way. How would they like to do it? Or which way do you suggest? And when I worked at City University, it was the same thing. I was very lucky to work with this man that asked, invited me to office meetings with all the tutors. What do you suggest, Vicky? How would you do this? What's your, your example of what to do? And they took on board everything I said because it was coming from my heart and not my head. Because I wasn't going to gain anything from, tell, from saying anything here, but here, yes tell them the truth, how I felt, how I think it would go, and how it would work. And it did work because I was connecting to that universal heart energy. Oh, I, I like what you just said. It's, I never thought of it, but there's a common belief that if you many times if you say the truth it, it will not you will not benefit from it or if you say how you feel and stuff but then perhaps like you say it's there's a broader um meaning to it and how your truth will have ripple effects in a way also. That's it. It's, it's, it's the butterfly effect from the spectrum of, of what where we are on that spectrum. When we look at the spectrum and, and, and where we are, and it can be a spectrum of many different colors, many different layers, and it depends where you, where you place yourself. And you don't even need to think about where you're placing yourself because you could be at the lower end one day and at the higher end the other day because we're all, we all vibrate at different levels each day. It's not the same every day. We have our highs and lows and we know that. And when we have a low day, well, we would try and raise our vibration and do something we enjoy, but don't push yourself to work that day. It won't work. You have to change your vibration first, don't you? So it, it's about accessing this information, but not going, oh, I must do that, I must do it, because it won't work. It's gotta come from, from a heart energy, a good place when you're feeling relaxed, when you're feeling not in need and when you feel that, okay, I don't care anymore. Mm. I don't care what the result is. If it happens, it happens. But when you care too much, nothing will happen. 
So why should we, why are we pushed to care? Like, why are we pushed so much to care for, let's say, the planet and the people you love and, and all of that? Does it apply? Even well, that's, if a, that's a different type of caring because okay. that, that is a, considered love for the planet and love for your family. So but when we want, want things, that's a different type of caring. You know, what do I care and want in my life? But when we don't care less about what we want anymore, then it comes. So you still can care for the, for the family and nature and everything else and the planet, but it's about allowing things to be released and let go. Don't keep on insisting on recycling that plastic bottle, you know, because it just won't work. And it won't work, you know, if we, if we keep on drumming that same instrument going into the ground, it won't work if we keep saying save save electricity, save gas, save petrol, you know, don't switch the light on at night because you can't sit in a freezing cold room and you've just got to realize at the end of the day, okay, what makes me happy? I need to feel warm. I need to eat. I need to feel comfortable. So do things that make you feel happy and comfortable. Then you know that everything is all right because the expenses won't come into it because I'm finding that just by putting and doing what I want when I need it, there is no higher cost of electricity. There is no higher cost in the petrol. The only higher cost comes in if we think about, oh, I've got to do that long journey. But think about doing it in a different way. Could you take a bus for free? Could you use the tube? Share a ride with a friend? It's just about doing things in a different way. Be conscious about maybe having half of what you used to eat on your plate. And then you don't gain weight either. You lose weight. You feel better, right? Maybe share that extra with your neighbor or your friend down the street. And doesn't that make you feel good then that you've helped someone? Maybe the, the clothes that you've got in your wardrobe that you've kept for 20 years and you think, I'll just keep that coat because I really need it now and I need another pair of shoes. But instead of keeping it, why don't you think that maybe some, there's somebody out there that could do those shoes on their feet or that coat for the winter? And it's not just about looking for, for the tramp on the street, but it's about actually putting it out there and saying, well, this is free. Would you like this? because we, we start charging for things all the time. We don't give things away. And it's about giving and learning to give. And what you give out, you receive back. It's the law of the universe. And you give back what you want, you receive what you need in whatever way it comes. Perhaps somebody will be giving something to you that you need. I've had so many people give me such good turns and good deeds for, for things that I've passed on to other people, but they've come from other people in, in a different direction, a different route. And I felt so blessed, so blessed. And I, it's not as though I've done it on purpose. It's just that it's my life. It's how I've learned to live. And I have to go back to that phrase again that, that my mother always said, the universe will provide. It's just knowing that you're okay. Everything's all right. I need to stop the recording.